me. That's not you. That's those on me. Good job. Thanks, Charles. Merry Christmas. It officially feels like Christmas. Hey, would you all just give it up for our worship uh, team this morning as they kicked off our Christmas season, right? Uh, that is where we are, by the way. We are in a journey to the Christmas story through the book of Luke. And so if you have your Bibles, open them up to Luke. Uh, if you want, you can always get a scripture journal uh, in the entryway. And it's the book of Luke with room to take notes beside it as we're going to walk through this book together as a church. And last week we started this story with Luke writing to Theophilus. We met this man that he, uh, Luke wanted to encourage his faith. Say, hey, I don't want you to wonder if all these things you hear are true. I want you to be certain. So Luke 1, 4 tells us that you may have certainty concerning the things that you've been taught. And it's from that certainty that he wants to build into Luke and build into us today that he introduced us to the arrival of the good news. That's what happened last Sunday. Last Sunday, we looked at Luke chapter 1, and the good news arrived at humanity. Now, when it got there, Zechariah didn't do a great job of receiving it. We saw that. Then we see that Mary did. She received the news fully and received it well. And there's actually another character that's woven in there at the end of Zechariah's story, his wife Elizabeth. We see that she as well received this as good news. Today, we're going to see those two stories of Elizabeth and Mary combine. And what, what happens when they meet each other is we get this beautiful picture in Scripture of what the life of somebody looks like when they believe and receive the word of God is true. And it starts in verse 39. It says, In those days Mary arose and went with haste to the hill country, to a town in Judah. And she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. When Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, the baby leaped in her womb. Now, this baby, by the way, we saw last week is John. John is the one that's going to be the forerunner for Jesus. So kind of the promised, uh, in the spirit of Elijah, going to get people ready for the Messiah from the Old Testament, like this, this John. So John is the one that's in her womb, and he's the one that apparently leaps. Verse 42. I'm sorry, uh, We'll go back to verse 41. When Elizabeth heard the greeting, the baby leaped in her womb. Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, the same Holy Spirit that we were told was going to be in John from the womb, the Holy Spirit that was going to be on Mary, the Holy Spirit that shows up in the book of Acts, and the Holy Spirit that indwells all believers. This Holy Spirit enters into this moment right here with Elizabeth. She exclaimed with a loud cry, verse 42, blessed are you among women, blessed is the fruit of your womb. And why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? Note those words, my Lord, by the way, if you're taking notes. The word Lord is going to show up dozens of times in Luke's writing, but especially in these front chapters, because he's proving something to Theophilus, who's, who's got this letter. He's proving that Jesus didn't start some movement later on. This wasn't some charismatic leader that showed up and people thought like, ooh, we can do something with him. No, he's showing that before Jesus even drew a breath, before anybody else even knew that there was a baby to be had, he was already Lord. Because it reminds us that Lord is a term of authority. And throughout all eternity, the word of God has been authority, amen? Amen. If God says it, that holds the ultimate authority. Creation came into existence through the authority of God's word. So the word's always been, it's always been Lord, but now the Lord has arrived in a unique and tangible way. And so Jesus has always been Lord. It's not something he becomes. It says, the, the Lord, the mother of my Lord should come to me. Verse 44. Behold, when the sound of your greeting came to my ears, the baby in my womb leaped for joy, and blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. And again, a connection that God spoke, but also this baby that is in her womb is the Lord, reminding us that Jesus is God with us. And what we see happening in here, obviously, is, is a lot of encouragement for Theophilus. But there's three things that are happening in this moment that are going to happen for the rest of history. So the first thing is Jesus being announced. John does this from the womb, right? That's what he was made to do was announce Jesus. He's already doing it. I don't know how successful any of you guys feel. I don't think I was successful before I was even born. John was. He's got a pretty good gig going. He's already announcing Jesus. Jesus hasn't even got there yet. And he's like, hey, Jesus is here. He's leaping for joy is how Elizabeth describes it. 
She describes it that way because it says she's filled with the Spirit of God. So she knows this isn't just a six-month-old baby kicking. This is joy being expressed at the presence of Jesus. And so we have an announcement that Jesus is here. We also have the Spirit revealing Jesus is here. The Spirit is the one that gave her this, this idea. All we know is that Mary gave a greeting. It says she went with haste from where she was, probably a three to four day journey. So there's, there's no news that could have got to Elizabeth before this. The picture is Mary just shows up. We don't believe she's told any of her story, but somehow miraculously, and I believe through the Holy Spirit, Elizabeth realizes that Jesus is there. The Holy Spirit reveals, because that's what the Holy Spirit does, by the way. John 16, 13 says it like this. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak. For he will only declare to you the things that are to come. And so the Spirit is one that leads into truth. That's what the Holy Spirit does. The Holy Spirit that eventually will live in all of us shows up here and leads Elizabeth to the truth that Jesus is the Christ. So already, Jesus is announced that he's there. The Holy Spirit reveals Jesus is there. And what does Elizabeth do? The same thing all of us should do. Whenever it's announced to us that Jesus is here, when the Spirit says, look, God is at work, Jesus is here, we rejoice that Jesus is there. So she rejoices. She just overflows with joy that God has invaded her life. That's going to happen for the rest of human history. There will be people announcing, Jesus is here. That's the one who can save. This is the one who takes away the sins of all mankind. This is the one who makes you right with God. That announcement, and then the Spirit is going to come around that announcement and open people's eyes in a miraculous way to say, hey, what you're hearing, it's true. You were made to be with God. And God's made a way. And when those two things combine, the announcement of truth and the revelation of truth from the Spirit, you rejoice. That is the joy of Christmas. If you're wondering what to be excited about at Christmas, it's this. Jesus is with us. And, And I say that because... We've got these words blessed, and we're going to talk a lot about blessing today. And I visited with one of my friends after service who said, it's it's so hard right now to feel blessed with the things that are missing in my life. And as he's walking through grief, we were able to look at this and say, even in the middle of the deepest loss and grief, you can still see that Jesus is here, that God is keeping his word, and everything God says is going to happen. And that is where you find blessing. That's where Mary finds blessing. Look at verse 45. This is the point of the text. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. This is what Luke wants us to see. That Elizabeth pans out. And instead of talking to, to Mary, it's like she's making this announcement. This general announcement to be recorded for all time. To say, blessed is she who believed And not just a general belief in God, yeah, I believe in God. No, but a specific belief, a very specific belief that says, I believe whatever God says, he is going to fulfill. If God says it, I believe it. If God says it will be done, he will bring it to fruition. It's a belief that God's word is true and will be true and will be completed. That is what caused her to be blessed because she received this word and she believed it. She was a good receiver. That's not something that people outside of football brag about, right? So you don't meet a whole lot of people, especially this time of year. Like I, like I brag on my wife about, you know, like, oh, like she's just a great gift giver. She's got this love language of gifts and things like that. Like it hits different if I'm like, man, do you all know what my gift is? I have the gift of receiving, <laughs> you know? Like I just, some, some, some of y'all know you're my people. We just got that gift. People give you gifts and they cry tears of joy. You're so good at receiving, like you just, they're moved. Like that, you, you can't really say, now some of y'all are like, Cody, I'll be in your club. We're gonna be receivers, you know. Like, I know some husbands are going home today and they're like, I know my gift, <laughs> found it. So, um, but like we, we don't really brag about that. In fact, a friend of mine, his kids were arguing, he was telling me about this, that, uh, about Christmas. And they were, you know, it was like, Christmas, what's it about? It's about giving. One said, and then the, the son was like, and receiving. And she was like, No. Can't, uh-uh, don't, don't bring that receiving stuff. And he was, but he was logical. He was like, no, if someone's giving, somebody has to be receiving or there's no giving. He was like, no, it's got to be giving. No, it's got to be receiving. It's escalating, right, as kids do. And the thing is, he had a point. 
for, for there to be joy in giving, there must be a recipient. And I think we miss out on a lot of things because we aren't good receivers. In our staff week, uh, staff time this week, we did our D group rhythms. We talk about what God's doing in our life, what we've been reading, and the several of us brought up that, that we wonder if we're missing out on even more that God has for us. Like I read about the freedom in scripture and I'm like, am I, do I experience that fully? Is there, do I live in the full freedom or, or do I still kind of like bend towards some, some legalistic things and, and working my way and trying to earn God's favor? And I see this all the time. I see people who don't experience the forgiveness of God, not because God hasn't forgiven, but they won't receive that God has forgiven them. They would rather hang on to blame and they'd rather hang on to shame than to walk in forgiveness. I've seen people refuse to receive their identity from Christ, to know that they are fully known, fully loved, made exactly how he intended them to be, where they intended to be, and they are his, free of everything else, and they keep on neglecting that identity to try and find an identity by the world's standards. Over and over, I see people every week who refuse to receive help. They refuse to receive good things. They refuse to receive truth. They say, I don't need to be in a group. I I can grow on my own. I don't need accountability. Listen, I don't need help in my faith. I don't need help in my family. And I just think, what what is waiting for us if we become good receivers of God's word? I actually think our inability to receive and believe God's word fully is the thing that keeps us from experiencing God fully. So we need to become good receivers just like Mary was. This is actually, by the way, at the heart of the Christian faith. Whenever Jesus walks among us in his teaching, one of his teachings in Matthew 13 is a parable of the sower. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. Like, if you don't know it, it's fine. I'll, I'll kind of summarize. Jesus gives this story that this guy goes out and scatters seed everywhere, and there's seed that falls on all kinds of different ground, and, and only some of it bears fruit. The rest of it kind of gets ruined, and the, the disciples are like, hey, Jesus, I thought we were talking about faith. Why do you talk about farming so much? And he's like, I'll explain it to you. So he walks them back through this in Matthew 13, and he says, hey, some of that seed, it falls on hard ground, and birds going, just pick it away. Those are the people that they're not even willing to receive the word. They, they won't believe it all, and it's just gone. Some of them receive it with joy. They're really excited, but it never takes root. They really don't believe it. This sounds good, but, but I, I'm not going to believe that more than I believe I've got to be in control of my life. I'm not going to believe it more than dot, 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 and it doesn't take root. And so what happens is when life gets hard, suddenly that faith is gone. And then the next person, it says they receive it, and it starts to grow, but it grows with all the cares of the world, and all the cares of the world just chokes out that faith, and there's no fruit to it. But then he said some of the seed, it falls on good ground. It's received, and the roots grow deep, and it bears fruit. That's what it looks like to receive God's word and let it take root in your life and truly believe it. This is echoed all throughout the New Testament, by the way. 1 Thessalonians, I'll throw a few scriptures up here. 1 Thessalonians 2.13. It says, we also thank God constantly for this, that when you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but what it really is. Waiting for it, I don't quite have it memorized. Which is the word of God. There it is which is at work in you believers, right? So notice the word received, right? Okay, I want to go to the next one. This is out of James, James chapter one. If you look at James one, therefore put away all filthiness and rampant wickedness. I put stuff out of my life. What do I put in its place? You receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. So there's that word receive again, God's word being received. Now I want to look at first Peter. Look at first Peter. Since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. The word of God is this seed that you have to say, I'm going to receive that, I'm gonna believe it deeply, and I'm gonna let that give me life. Mary was a perfect example of this. God's word had came to her, she received this, she believed this. She was a good receiver. I wanted to read her response to receiving this. Verse 46, Mary said, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, for he has looked on the humble estate of his servant. For behold, from now on all generations will call me blessed. For he who is mighty has done great things for me, 
And holy is his name, and his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. For he has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted the humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped to serve in Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Mary seems just burst into the song. It's recorded in song form, which, yes, brings a couple of questions to light. Uh, and I'll give you a few thoughts on them. One, I think perhaps Mary was an early adopted of the ancient psalm from Buddy that the best way to spread Christmas cheer is singing loud for all to hear. And so maybe Mary was just like, hey, it's song time. I'm also a fan of musicals. Anybody in here like musicals? Okay, you're my people. I have no problem with thinking Elizabeth, filled with the Spirit, says these things, and Mary's like, <clears throat> I'm so blessed, right? Like, she's just, like, in it. And there's some choreography, maybe. Like, I, so th that's what happens in here when I read this. Um, now, of all the things that could be, here's what's certain. What's certain is this type of poetic, recorded response to God's deliverance is consistent throughout human history. What's certain is what happens here with Mary has been recorded throughout the Old Testament and happening every time God's delivering his people. And so you go back to, through the history of song to Exodus 15. Exodus 15, God's people have been delivered by God through the Red Sea from the Egyptians and Miriam burst forth in this song that's recorded to remind her generation and future generations that God is a deliverer. And then you fast forward and you get to Judges chapter 5. Judges chapter 5, God again delivers his people from the oppression of a king through the hand of Jael and Deborah the prophetess breaks into the song that's recorded for previous generations and future generations to know God delivers his people. And then you get to 1 Samuel. In 1 Samuel chapter 2, you see Hannah. You see Hannah burst into song. And actually that song of Hannah and this song of Mary have a lot of overlap. And she burst into song because God had delivered her from her barrenness and delivered to her people the final judge and the first prophet. God was again bringing his word to his people. And whenever God delivered his people, it seems that he would affirm this with, with a woman recognizing it and, and being moved to state God's goodness. And here's Mary in the New Testament connecting this to all the other stories so that when Theophilus reads it, he can't think this is some new thought. He has to go, this is the same story that God has been telling throughout human history. Because here she is, celebrating their deliverance once again. It is important to note, she doesn't celebrate this deliverance after the crucifixion. It's already celebrated. A reminder that our faith is not in an act, but it's in a person. It's in Jesus. Jesus was already the deliverer. He was already the Savior. And the way that the Old Testament believers were saved was through faith that God was going to keep his word. They looked forward to a deliverer the same way that we look back on a deliverer. And so Mary's modeling this Old Testament salvation of I believe that God is going to deliver us and I'm affirming he is doing it now and I see it. And she is moved to this incredible worship. And as she's moved into this, you'll notice it starts personal. Look at verse 47 or 46. My soul magnifies the Lord. By the way, if there's, there's a few scriptures that I wish or I hope will be said of me when my life here is done, that's one of them. She says, my soul magnifies the Lord. She recognizes in this moment, God has taken who I am, my mind, my emotions, my heart, my experiences, my body, everything that makes up Mary and who I am, and God has used me as a magnifying glass for him. My soul is magnifying God. That's what he's doing in this moment. Oh, that that would be said of us, church, right? That we could wake up and say, my soul magnifies the Lord. He is made great when people look at me. Then she says, my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior, because she needed a Savior. Mary was human. Mary was sinful. Mary needed a Savior, and she received it and welcomed it recognizes the saving work of God. For as he looked on the humble estate of his servant, that's why she rejoices, because she was humbled and God saw her. 
Now all generations will call me blessed. He who is mighty has done great things for me. Holy is his name. She recognizes what God has done for her. Don't, don't miss this. Again, God is not an impersonal, distant God. The God of Scripture and the God of human history, the God of eternity, is a personal God who can do great things for you, exercise his might for you, save you, see you in your humble estate. God sees you. He's not too busy. He is not too distant. He sees you. But then she goes from that. She doesn't stay there because it's not just about her. When you, when you get a glimpse of God, you're like, this God has done this for me, but he's been doing this for everybody. And she pans out and she realizes God, God is executing justice for all of the people that are dependent on him. And she draws this distinction between the God-dependent and the self-dependent, between the humble and the proud, between the hungry and the rich. See, does God have something against rich people? No. God has something against self-dependent people. He says that if they refuse me, do not want me, then, then they won't experience me. The distinction here is the humble go, I don't have anything else I need, God. The proud say, I can do this on my own. The poor, the hungry say, I'm in desperate need of something I cannot fulfill. The rich say, I'll take care of my own needs. The picture here, verse 51 says, is the heart. He scattered the proud on the thoughts of their heart. It's not what's in your wallet, it's what's in your heart. Where is your dependence? Those who long and depend for God experience his saving work, and that's who Israel was. Verses 54 and 55, this is the anchor of this text. She says, he has helped his servant Israel, the people of Israel, the promised one, in remembrance of his mercy, as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, to his offspring forever, now, 54 and 55 connect back to verse 45. Why was Mary blessed? She was blessed because she believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her from the Lord. Now, that word spoken is the same word that shows up in verse 55. It says, God has helped his servant. How did he help them? He remembered his mercy. How does God execute his mercy on our behalf? He speaks to us. That's how. God, God speaking to his people. That's how he helps us. That's how he shows us mercy. When God is giving his word to us, God giving his word is merciful. The fact that we have this is an act of mercy from God. I, Cody Brumley, rejected God and wanted to make myself the authority of my life. It's a thing called sin that infects me. I chose that, and God could have said, you chose you, not me, justice. That's the end of it. Instead, he said, mercy, I'm going to send you something to announce that there's better. I'm going to send you something so you'll know I love you and there's a way back. The fact that we have the word of God announced to us is the mercy of God. Not only is it merciful, it's helpful. This is how we are led throughout life. This is how we are moved forward. This is how God has orchestrated care for his people. And the Holy Spirit is called the helper, Right? So we have the announcement of God, which is an act of mercy, and now we have the Holy Spirit who reveals Jesus Christ to us, which is the greatest help. We need his spirit to see what God is doing. And God helps his people. So his word is merciful. His word is helpful, and it's personal. It has to be personally received. This comes back to your willingness to believe and receive the word of God. No one can make you do that. It was the word, not just to Abraham, but he spoke to Abraham and to all of his offspring. He says that he speaks, this active, he spoke to our fathers as he did to them, to Abraham and to all of his offspring forever. God is still speaking. So what is the blessed life then? Well, the blessed life, it's, it's this real-time experience of receiving and believing God's word. It's the active experience. Whenever you hear God's word and you say, you know what, I'm going to receive that. I'm not going to neglect it. I'm not going to reject it. I'm not going to forget it. I'm going to receive what I hear from God as true, and I'm going to believe it. I'm going to put it into practice. If you all got to know, I had to preach this to myself this week. I stood here on Thursday with people I loved and said goodbye to a friend who was 39 years old. Your life ended with ALS, a college friend of mine, you, ne you never think when you meet them that you will be doing their funeral service. And, 
And as those things unfolded, I had to look at God and say, God, I have a choice. I can live under the burden of thinking that that you don't have control and that you don't care and that you are distant and you don't keep your word, or I can experience the blessing of trusting that you, even in grief and pain and hardship like this, that you are good and you are sovereign and what you say will be fulfilled. And so I don't grieve alone, I grieve with hope. I had to preach that to myself and believe God's word deeply to be able to walk through that moment. And what I experienced in this surprising grief-filled space was something called blessing. Blessing is not the stuff and the moments we receive. Blessing is that real-time experience that you have when you are believing God's word, you are receiving God's word, and you are able to trust that he is still sovereign no matter what. That's what it means to be blessed. Mary was blessed because she believed God was fulfilling her word. We can be blessed by the real-time experience of believing that. That barrier between burden and belief is or burden and blessing is belief. You can live under the burden that you have to have control and have the things and you've got to figure it out or you can live under the blessing of what God has said will be fulfilled and I can surrender to that. I would love for you all, and I believe Luke would love for Theophilus to experience the blessing of receiving the word of God and believing it deeply and letting him change his life. That is where this takes us today. So as we turn our attention, that's where I want you to be. I want you to be blessed by believing that the God who fulfills his word in time is fulfilling it in you. That's what I want you to to experience the blessing of knowing that God is fulfilling his word in time and throughout all human history, but not just throughout all time. He's fulfilling it in you personally. If you would, bow your heads, close your eyes, turn your attention to the Lord. Our band's gonna come up. They're gonna take us through a full song of worship, a full time of response. And in that time, if there's a move for you to make, I want you to make it first towards the Lord that you would commit to receiving his word and believing it deeply and living in that joy. But second, if there's a move you need to make, following Jesus, pursuing baptism or joining the church, uh, make your way across the back of this room to those double doors that are open and talk with one of our pastors. We would love to help you take your next step. God, would you lead us with your spirit and by your word to blessing right now? Lord, as we worship you, move us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.